everybody you are live at steepleview farm thank you so much for joining us this morning you know i'm looking out the window again i say this every saturday morning i don't know how in the world it's possible but we just end up with the most beautiful weather outside our window every time we get ready to start this show and it just warms my heart to know that well even though it's going to be 95 again out there today it's still beautiful and a great time to be outside you know with all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world what better place to be than on a farm outside fresh air sunshine vitamin d all the great hard work you do that makes your muscles stronger your mind clear and your heart filled with joy Thanks for being with us. Thanks for being with us live from Steepleview Farm this morning. I want to talk with you today about a couple of things, but as we do when we get together every Saturday morning, I want to talk with you a little bit about the weather around the world and in my little neck of the woods. Take a look at this. We're not going to get out of this hot weather for a while. 95 tomorrow. There's some rain coming our way. That's good. You know, we irrigate our crops. We use city water. We pay for that a lot. And um, while we're irrigating our crops with water and paying for it, we keep looking at the sky and saying, come on, the best water comes from those clouds. Let's see if we can't get some of that down here to help the stuff we've got in the ground already grow and thrive and be better. But God's in charge. We'll just have to wait and see. Talking about the stuff that's in the ground, what can we do if we haven't gotten everything in the ground yet? Let's take a look at the Old Farmer's Almanac. We continue to plant by the moon. We've told you many times that over the years, we found this to be a remarkable tool. It has helped us immensely. We've ended up with a better crop every year that we followed these suggestions. Today and tomorrow, good planting days. We'll talk a little bit about some things you could be planting for your fall garden today. Got a couple of barren days coming up and then some more plant. Look at that. The 24th, pretty much through the 28th, good planting days there too. So got some stuff you want to get out. Want to get that fall garden started. Got to get some carrots in the ground. Got to get some more cabbage out. You want to start planting some beets, you know, all those beautiful colored beets. How about some corn? thought about that you know you can plant corn that'll mature get the earlier maturing varieties get corn that'll mature in september and you're going to be beyond some of the pests and some of the other problems that those of us who are raising corn in the summertime face and speaking of pests on your corn have you seen this guy flying around have you seen one of these i'm not surprised moths have a tendency to fly around at night but this guy here, that is the moth that makes the little worm that's called the corn earworm. Corn earworms and tobacco worms, and I'm sorry, tomato worms, pretty much the same insect. But that little guy right there that eats down through the silks of your corn and gets into the tips of your ears, destroys the marketability and makes them just disgusting because... I mean, they're not just in there eating, they're leaving behind their excrement. You know, you've got to get rid of these guys before they do much damage. How does this bug get into your corn? Well, this critter here, flying around at nighttime, this time of the year, is going to be attracted to the silks 
on your ears of corn. Now, for those of you who've been keeping track of this over the years, like I have, you know that when the first silks appear, your corn is probably ready in about 20 days. So 20 days from the time the first silks appear, that's when you're going to want to harvest your sweet corn. Well, guess what? This guy's going to find it as soon as those silks appear, and he's going to lay eggs or she's going to lay eggs on those silks. Those eggs are going to hatch into little bitty tiny caterpillars. They're going to grow and eat their way down into your ear of corn. Not a good thing. You don't want that. How do you protect your corn from that kind of an invasion? How do you get rid of these guys? Well, I recommend that you use a combination of BT. We've talked about that before. You can buy it in powdered form called Dipel, or you can go to some of the box stores and find it in a liquid form, BT. And the reason you want to use BT is because it is a caterpillar killer. It will kill those little tiny caterpillars before they get big enough to eat into your corn. Well, how do you apply it? Here's the problem. Here's the reason why organic farmers do not typically grow sweet corn for market. First, you're going to get one ear per stalk. You know, that's an awful lot of stalks to come up with a lot of corn to sell at a market or to sell to your CSA. Corn is really a difficult crop to raise. It doesn't have a great deal of market appeal. I mean, it has a lot of market appeal. People want it, but it doesn't appeal to the farmer because the price is so cheap, $5 a dozen and you know all that work. Well, here's the real work. To keep those corn earworms out of your corn, you're going to need to apply this BT. You're going to need to apply either the Dipel in the powdered form or the liquid form on your corn. How do you do that? Get yourself one of those little squeeze bottles that you get ketchup or mustard in. You can buy them at the grocery store. You can buy them at a, a, a kitchen store, a supply store. Those little squeeze bottles, get one of those. Mix the BT, according to the manufacturer's instructions, with an oil. Now, you can use mineral oil, which is, of course, an oil byproduct. But people eat it. They use it for other things. Mineral oil is a good medium for the BT. Or you can use any other oil, olive oil, corn oil, vegetable oil. Mix it up in that little bottle, and then here's where the work comes in. You're going to have to go through your garden and to find these guys and apply this product, you're going to have to put a couple of drops right at the tip of each ear, right where the silks go in. Now, the oil will suffocate some of the worms, and the BT will ultimately kill the others. The mechanism by which BT works, and by the way, it is organically approved, BT is, it's an organically approved natural occurring bacteria. Does it kill these bugs? Does it kill these worms like an insecticide? No. It's an organically approved insecticide because it destroys the digestive abilities. It's a feeding suppressant. So the caterpillars eat the BT, it gets in their system and they die before they can get into your corn and destroy it. Start looking for the silks. 20 days later, start looking for the raccoons. Actually, you ought to start a few days before that because the old story goes, the old farmer's story is, you know how to tell when your corn is ready to pick? The day after the coons get to it. They'll always find it when it's at its sweetest, and they'll always destroy it before you can pick it. Protect yourself against raccoons. I use electric fence. We use electric poultry netting with a solar charger around it, around our corn patch, to protect our corn. A lot of things want to eat that corn. So do you. It's going to be sweet. It's going to be delicious. If you pick it at the right time, pick it early in the morning. Try to pick your corn as early in the morning as possible. When the temperatures are still cool, that's when the sugar content is at its highest. Protect your corn from the corn moth. Protect your corn from the corn worms. And protect your corn from the raccoons. And uh, not too far down the road here, you're going to start harvesting some sweet corn for you and your family. Let's talk a little bit about other things that you may already be harvesting in your garden. And let me give you a couple of tips on how to harvest it so you get a better crop to put on your table. Right now, everybody is saying, oh, my, sweet, my summer squash, my yellow squash is coming on. And this is what squash will look like very shortly after it blooms. And from there... 
to be in the size of your arm is probably only, you know, a, a day or so. So if you're going to harvest this squash, if you're going to get out and harvest squash, how do you do it? How do you get it off of the plant? How do you get it off of the vine? Here's my method. Squash can be twisted. You can just grab the end of the squash and give it a couple of twists and it will break off and a piece of that stem that you see underneath the squash connected to the vine will come with it. Squash is easy to harvest just by twisting. Now, there's another crop that's coming on. It is also a summer squash, zucchini. When you look at your zucchini in the store or you look at zucchini that is properly harvested, it has a piece of stem attached to it. You want that. Zucchini, unlike squash, does not twist off. That stem on zucchini is much tougher. It's a much harder stem. If you try to twist your zucchini, chances are the softer fruit just inside of that stem is going to break. And now you've got an open scar, a place for pathogens to get into your fruit. If you're going to market with your fruit, it's going to be undesirable. It's going to have a chunk of zucchini missing. You don't want that. If you're going to harvest zucchini and you want to keep that piece of stem on it, when you look at that zucchini on the vine, here's a beautiful dark zucchini, perfect harvest stage, a little bit of the zucchini blossom still attached. The best way to harvest it is to use a sharp knife. Be careful you don't go into the fruit. Cut just like you would if you were looking at this zucchini. Cut about that far up on the stem. Use a knife to cut through that stem and find yourself harvesting zucchini that looks just like the stuff in the grocery store and looks just like the stuff that you want to have on your table, whether that table is at home or that table is at a farmer's market. Now, another fruit that people are starting to harvest right now, cucumbers. You know, I've had a lot of people come to our farm and they enjoy the pick your own opportunity of walking through the gardens at Steepleview Farm. And a lot of those folks are just so anxious to see fruit hanging like this and they want to take it off of the vine and they want to take it home. One of the things we do when people come to harvest fruit at our pick your own operation is we go with them the first time and we give them a tip on how to, how to pick certain kinds of fruits. If you look at this cucumber, if you look at this cucumber hanging on the vine, there's a very easy way to pick it that won't do harm to it or the vine. Grab the cucumber. Put your thumb right up on top of it, right where it's connected to the stem, and then just push the stem off. That's right. Just take your thumb and push the stem off of the cucumber. The stem will break right at the top of the cucumber, and you will have a cucumber that's not harmed. You won't harm the vine, and you'll have a beautiful cucumber to serve to your family and friends. Now, tomatoes. Everybody's cherry tomatoes ought to be coming on now. How do you harvest cherry tomatoes? You know, you can go through and pick those one at a time. You can, you, can, <laughs> you can pick every tomato off one at a time and leave the green ones. I recommend, though, instead of picking them one at a time, that on cherry tomatoes, you cut the entire bunch. Cut them off as a bunch. Bring them in the house as a bunch. You're not going to be throwing them into a basket, probably. They're not going to be bouncing around against each other like larger tomatoes. Bring them in as a bunch. Bring those entire vines of cherry tomatoes. Clip them off up high. Bring them in the house and pick them off to eat them as you need them. But that's not like you do with a regular tomato. If you see a regular tomato hanging on the vine, this looks beautiful. You see them in the store like that. These little pieces of the stem are on there. The remnants of the bloom that, that was on there are gone from the bottom. But just that little bit of leaf structure that was below the bloom where the fruit forms, that just, it looks so beautiful, doesn't it? Well, there's a disadvantage, unfortunately, to leaving these stems on, particularly if you're boxing them to take them to market. Those little stems are stiff, and they will end up poking holes in your tomatoes. All the other tomatoes in the box, all the other tomatoes in the bag, all the other tomatoes in the crate will get holes poked in them. The skins will be punctured. Pathogens will get in. They'll begin to leak. They can begin to go bad. 
take your thumb, just take your thumb and push that little stem off. It'll break right off. And when you're done, you'll have tomatoes that look like this. That is called a stem scar there at the top of that tomato. And for people who are confused about how to ripen a tomato when you get it home or how to package a tomato in a box, if you're going to a farmer's market, here's a little tip. You want that stem scar up. A lot of people will turn a tomato upside down. They'll have the bloom side up and the stem scar down. Actually, the shoulders of a tomato, that's the part that looks like this. That's the part that's right around the stem scar on the top of those tomatoes. It's actually a tender part of the tomato. And if you turn that tomato upside down to store it, it'll tend to bruise. If you bruise your tomatoes at market, they're not marketable. You end up pitching those or you end up canning those yourself. If you're going to put a tomato out for it to ripen, or you're going to put a tomato out on display at a farmer's market, or you're going to put a tomato out on display just to show them during a picnic, put them stem scar side up. But I want to point out something else. Do not wash tomatoes. Typically, they're not grown close to the ground. They're not down in the soil like potatoes or carrots or parsnips or beets or turnips. So they're going to be relatively clean. You can wipe them off with a clean cloth. But that stem scar is very porous. If you put those tomatoes in water and wash them and the water becomes soiled, that water can make its way into that tomato plant, that tomato itself, and it can cause pathogens to get inside. Yes, there are methods by which you can wash tomatoes. If you're in the farmer's market business or you're doing a, a farm stand or you're selling tomatoes and you want to wash them, please study the specific water temperatures for washing and rinsing tomatoes. It has to be at a much higher temperature than you might imagine, and that's because those stem scars are porous and they allow pathogens to get inside a higher temperature water can help prevent that. I recommend just wiping them off. Do not wash them. And of course, do not refrigerate tomatoes. Um, if you have to keep them cool, if you're a market gardener like we are, if you're selling at market, you're selling from the farm, we have a special refrigeration zone at about 60 degrees. 55 to 65, there's a little fluctuation as the cool bot moves up and down as it cools and then warms up and triggers another cooling cycle. 55 to 65 degrees is a good temperature for tomatoes. It kind of replicates room temperature in a home. It's a little bit lower than room temperature, but it's not that 40 degrees refrigerated temperature that has a tendency to just destroy the flavor and the texture of tomatoes. Now, if you've got a garden and you've been walking around looking at it this morning, you're probably seeing some peppers of all different sorts. These are just some pictures of some bell peppers, but you're probably getting your banana peppers now, your poblano peppers, you're getting jalapeno peppers, you're getting your mamma mia giallo peppers, you might be getting some cayenne peppers, you're getting a lot of peppers out of your garden this time of the year. Well, this is probably one of the lessons that we have to give most often to people who do the pick your own. They don't know how to pick a pepper in the garden. So let me just give you a little tip. Peppers do very well if you just grab the pepper and lift, kind of bend it straight up. With one motion, just bend it up, and that pepper will break off right there where the stem on the pepper joins the stem leading back to the plant. It'll break off right there. That is true for virtually every kind of pepper that we've been able to raise. So we train people just grab the pepper, whether it's a jalapeno or a banana pepper or a green pepper or whatever, just grab it and just bend it up a little bit and it'll break off right there. The stem will stay with it. Uh, you won't have a stem scar. Uh, the pepper will do very well. That is a great way to harvest your peppers. Now, I know some of you are probably a little bit surprised by this next slide, but I want to talk with you about harvesting carrots. You might think it's summertime and therefore carrots are not going to be growing. You can grow carrots literally all year round. We have carrots in the ground all winter long that we harvest in the spring. But harvesting carrots is difficult for a lot of people. Not everybody has that wonderful sandy loamy soil that you see on gardens in British Columbia or in Canada or in other parts of the country. Um, Carrots tend to grow in the soil wherever you are, and most people in the summertime find that soil to get a little compacted, a little bit hard, maybe there's a little bit too much clay in it, uh, and they go out and they see those carrot tops and they go, 
boy, they're nice and tall. It's time to harvest those carrots. We've got to get them up out of the ground. And they grab a hold of them and they pull on them and boop, they get the top of the carrot. They get a little leafy structure, but they don't have any carrots. Carrots are easy to harvest. We call it popping carrots. And I recommend that you don't use a shovel. A shovel is a blade on a stick. I recommend that you use a garden fork, you know, a big heavy duty garden fork. Take your fork, put it in the ground, just some distance back from your row of carrots, not right on them, so that you don't damage the fruit. Insert the fork into the ground with your foot, push it down hard till it's down pretty low. And then just bend the fork backward until you loosen the ground a little bit where the carrots are. The carrots will have loosened to the ground themselves. They will have expanded into that soil. They will have pushed the soil aside, but they're going to be in there pretty tight in the summertime. If you're going to be popping carrots in the summertime, get a garden fork, stick it in the ground six or eight inches out from the row, push it in pretty good and pull it back, work your way down the row however far you think you're going to get the carrots, and then gently begin loosening them from the soil. You're going to have a much better harvest. And one last little tip this morning, speaking of harvests, I want to give a shout out to a group called Harvest Hosts, harvesthosts.com. For you folks who are operating farms like we do here, who invite people to come visit, watch what we do, enjoy our produce, get a lesson on gardening, get a lesson on how reconnecting with the earth is not only good for your body, but good for your mind and your soul as well. If you're the kind of person who has a location that is suitable for people to come to visit, I recommend that you sign up as a host with Harvest Hosts. Harvest Hosts this year has been bringing the most wonderful people to our farm. And they've come and spent the night. Some have come and spent more than one night in their RVs. Folks who are members of the Harvest Host website, uh, I pay an annual fee and they get to stay at wineries breweries, farms all across the country. According to their website, 1147 locations are available where you can go spend the night for free if you're traveling around the country. And right now, an awful lot of people seem to be traveling around the country interested, it seems to me, in seeing the world, but not having to deal with all of the craziness out there, staying in hotels, not know who's been there before. Farms are a healthy place to visit, and more and more people are learning that. Speaking of visiting in a farm, go to our website, steepleviewfarm.com, watch our hours, and come see us. We'd love to have you come visit. We'd love to have you see what we do, and we'd love to see you here again next Saturday morning, Lord willing. Between now and then, take care of yourself, each other, and God bless.